First up today, I want to focus on a transfer situation and the transfer needs for the Premier League, specifically the top six teams. May not be in January, but over the next few windows, the summer perhaps, what do these big boys need? What kind of key additions do they need to make to improve their squads and take themselves to the next level? Over at Pro Soccer Talk, I've put up a transfer needs for all 20 Premier League clubs in January to earmark who needs, to, who needs what in the transfer window, who needs to make key signings in key areas. So let's run through the top six uh, right now between us and see who should go after certain players and what positions they really need strengthening. So, Nick, I'm going to start with you. Manchester City, uh, I said central striker is probably the only real area where they need to strengthen. Do you agree with that? And any names pop out off the page to you? Uh, that's the only, yeah. And it's it's Erling Holland, And he opened the door this weekend. And it's... Uh, for lack of a better term, Borussia Dortmund's fault. Uh, they apparently have been pressuring him. He has, and I want to give him full credit for this. He could have been hinting at where he wants to be and talking about the release clause for quite some time, but he hasn't. He's left it out there so he could focus on Dortmund, so he could be the guy who is faithful to his club. And they've pressured him enough that he's saying, listen, if we're going to do this, we have to talk about it now. And so... Um, Man City just brought in a boatload of money for Ferran Torres. If if they apply that towards what they were going to pay for a striker uh, and, and there are family connections here, I think they could bring him in. There are some questions about fit. Um, Andy and I think specifically has talked about this. But I also believe that we have seen Pep Guardiola work any number of stylistic players into his system. And I don't think he would waste a player like Erlen Holland. So I'm going to stick here and say that, yes, central striker is their need if their need, uh, if available, is one of the very, very, very best we've seen in the last 20 years. Totally agree with that. I think even watching their win against Chelsea at the weekend, the amount of balls that were whipped into the box around the six-yard box and nobody was there to finish it off. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, a centre forward would have finished that off. But sometimes maybe their system doesn't work as well with one static, slightly static forward. It, it's interesting, right? It's almost like a luxury signing at this point because they're winning trophies, winning the league uh, without a central strike or recognized central striker. Maybe that's just the way they play. Maybe they don't need that. Maybe they can just add another couple of attacking midfielders. So, yeah, really interesting to see what Man City does. And I think if Erling Haaland doesn't join them, then Kylian Mbappe would make sense. He can play in multiple positions across the, the forward line. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what Man City do with the obvious money that they have to spend on a new forward player. Andy Edwards, we're going to come to you. Liverpool, I, I went for a striker again, but I feel like they have another big area where they need to strengthen. Um, have a go. What do Liverpool need in the upcoming transfer windows? Yeah, I don't think it's striker. Um, they have the, the, the three and, and four, really, when Firmino is healthy, kind of underneath secondary attacking players who are very goal-minded. They score goals. They don't just set up goals for whoever's playing up top. They are very, very modern type of uh, slightly narrower wingers, if you will, kind of secondary forwards, like I said. So I think they can get all the goals that they need once they get Salah and Mane back from the Africa Cup of Nations. I think they're fine on that end of the field. It really is central midfield to me where they're very thin. Fabinho been very, very good. Uh, the last handful of seasons. Jordan Henderson, obviously the same. He's getting on just a little bit in his career. Curtis Jones has developed nicely and come along, but I'm not seeing a ton of depth in there. Nabi Keita has just not turned into the player that they thought that he would when he was signed. Uh, and, and so they are one or two injuries away, as they have been in, in, in past seasons and even this season as well, from being really shorthanded in the middle of the field. And I don't think that's going to mean them falling out of the top four race this season, uh, but I do look forward to next season and, and beyond that and say that's an area they absolutely have to strengthen because Fabinho uh, approaching 30 uh, here fairly slowly, Jordan Henderson on the wrong side of 30. So uh, I just think they need to make over that area of the field. Um, and, and there's so that the great thing is there's so many good players that fit the way that Liverpool want to play now because the pressing system is such a popular thing all around Europe. There's a lot of players that are working on it every single day, every single week, every single game, uh, and, and very, very good at it. So they'll have their pick of a lot of really talented players. Obviously, they've got the money to do it. And then Jurgen Klopp probably come back next season with an even better team and hopefully give Manchester City a real, real challenge for the title. Yeah, hard to agree with, uh, disagree with that. I obviously agree with all your analysis, Andy. Um, <laughs> 
Central midfield, I, yeah, that is a really good one because, like you said, a few of the players there, Henderson, Milner, Fabinho, all get in towards the end of their careers. Um, and you need, for the Klopp system, more robust central midfielders who may not be the flashiest, but they can get about the pitch. They can really get in players' faces. And then Henderson's, qual- obviously, his quality on the ball, he can really pick passes out and knit midfield and attack together. I'm looking at someone, there's a few central midfielders linked with Liverpool and others, Yuri Tielemans, who I know is a, a favourite of the show. Uh, yeah. James Wall-Prowse, I hate to say it as uh, someone from Southampton, but would be a very good Henderson replacement long-term, potentially. Um, and John McGinn is another name that we're going to talk about a bit further down this list. But there are some really good central midfielders who might be available, might not be, will cost a lot. But I feel like a lot of these big teams now have very similar needs uh, when it comes to the transfer market. Nick, let's move on to Chelsea. I think their key need, at least in January, is a left wing back. But do you see any other needs for them coming up? I'm looking at potentially the contractual situations they have there. There's a few gaps opening up in Thomas Tuchel's squad at the moment, isn't there? So they're going to have to be busy in January and in the summer. There there are gaps. I'm I'm looking at them as someone who needs to find a way to, and this is the most easier said than done thing that you could possibly say, find another or your next uh, Cesar Azpilicueta because he has been there forever. He has been good forever. Some managers have moved him out of the side and they've almost been forced to put him back in. Uh, I feel like he might be, since I've been watching every week for work, Every as many games as I can, he might be the most underrated player uh, in the league or underappreciated, I should say, player in the league. So, yeah, finding those next mainstays, those guys who can plug and play and have that versatility on that side of the pitch. Nothing against a Ben Chilwell or a Reese James who are who are very, very talented players. I look at Chelsea and I wonder I have a hard time projecting. I don't mean to take this in the wrong direction, but I have a hard time projecting what they should do because of what they've done. Uh, at manager over the last five years because there seem to even be some cracks in the way Tuchel is talking. We know he's overly honest, so maybe there's nothing to that. But I'm starting to think here's a team with uh, three of the best central midfielders in the world, <laughs> Incante, Jorginho, um, uh, and uh, and Mateo Kovacic. And I'm looking at all the attackers they have. And is this a team that really needs to be playing that formation? Is this So I want to know are we ever going to have a long-term system there? Because it does seem like that maybe more than personnel is what's stopping them from taking the next step. So I have a hard time saying they need anything other than a player who is versatile and can be there for 10 years. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the way that he plays with the system, the wing backs, the center backs, a lot of those players can interchange. I, I am looking at the center back situation in particular. Uh, I just think with Rudiger, yeah. As well as uh, Christiansen all out of contract and, you know, varying degrees of, of likeliness that they'll stay. It seems Rudiger and uh, especially Christiansen are really stalling on this new deal. They might have to look at bringing in uh, a couple of new centre backs, maybe in the summer, once those situations do or do not get resolved. Uh, and left back is a, is a big issue. Marcus Alonso is obviously holding down the fort while Chilwell's out. So maybe a short term solution there. Um, but yeah, Chelsea, you got so many good players. I think, like you said, the best thing is working out a system and partnerships and combinations for how to get the best out of them as a team. Cause you've seen that as an attacking unit, they have struggled to do that in recent months uh, under Thomas Tuchel. Okay. Let's focus on Arsenal. I think we all know where they need to strengthen, right? Central striker position, obviously Dusan uh, Vlahovic uh, for Fiorentina has been linked time and time again with them with Lacazette and Nketiah out of contract, Bamiang seemingly out of favour at Arsenal. It's a huge area where they need to improve. Andy, any other areas of improvement for, for Arsenal and areas uh, where they need new additions, uh, either this January? Because it's tough to do deals in January, so a lot of clubs now are lining up deals for the summer, right? And uh, I think one player we mentioned earlier might be key for Arsenal moving forward if they can get him. Yeah, it's they're in a tough situation because... In January, especially, they don't know if they're going to have Champions League next season. And I think Vlahovic, that's probably going to be a stipulation for wherever he ends up signing. He is of the quality. 
he needs to make the jump into the Champions League right now. Arsenal haven't been there in five years, as we talked about the last couple of weeks. And, and so I think they're going to have to wait until the summer, probably, if they want him. Now, they can go for another option in January, maybe somebody a little bit cheaper, a little more of a short-term option, or someone that they feel can give them 80 90% of the production of him at a fraction of the cost, and they can get him in a little bit sooner. I, I just think that he's going to be patient. He should be patient, at least, and wait and see, okay, what is the landscape next season? Because that's going to be very, very important for uh, you know setting up the rest of his career. And if they're not in Champions League, I think they're probably out. So maybe it's maybe it comes down as simply as whoever finishes fourth in the Premier League gets that final Champions League place, kind of has the inside track to, to getting Vlahovic. Um, and, and maybe it, to tie it back to something that Nick said earlier, I kind of like the fit of him at Manchester City a little or a lot better than Holland, just because he's more of a hold-up play, he's more involved in the linking and the creating going on, and a little bit less kind of straight line running towards goal to get on the end of chances. And I know, I know, Pep made it work with Samuel Eto'o a long, long time ago, but Holland is is another caliber of that, just a, you know, completely different level. So maybe Vlahovic fits there a little bit if Arsenal are not able to get into the top four and they have to kind of bow out of the race to sign him. I kind of think they need to strengthen the central midfield as well. That's kind of what was hinted at there of another player we mentioned, Yuri Tielemans alongside Thomas Partey. If Arsenal could get that deal done with his contract running down at Leicester, he'll have just over 12 months left at the end of the season. So that's very doable, I think, from a financial perspective, whether or not Arsenal do get into the Champions League. And for Tielemans, he needs to go somewhere where he's going to be the main man and he can dictate the tempo of the game like he does for Leicester. Obviously, great box-to-box play. And if, you know, you got Thomas Partey winning the ball, giving it to Tielemans, and he's feeding Saka, Smith, Rowe, Martinelli, and whichever striker they managed to bring in, that's great. I mean, that's a really, uh, almost Arteta-esque, the kind of player he is, and, and calm on the ball and knits everything together very nicely. And I think if he went to Liverpool or Man City, he'd maybe get lost in the squad a little bit, Tielemans. Obviously, a very, very good player, but he had a lot of very uh, good players around him who maybe he'd struggle to dictate the game as much as he would like. But I think if he went to Arsenal, he really would be given the keys to that midfield. And I'd love to see that personally. We're all huge Tielemans fans, of course. Um, talk about central midfield, Nick Mandola. Manchester United, that's an area we've known they've needed to strengthen for a very long time. Obviously, Paul Pop was out of contract in the summer. They're looking already at, looks like, replacements. John McGinn's name's been mentioned as a potential replacement Darren Fletcher the technical director apparently really loves his fellow countrymen in that role at Aston Villa do you think that's a good fit for United is McGinn good enough to have a big impact at Old Trafford and, and where else do you think they need to strengthen uh under Ralph Ragnick's I guess I was gonna say tutelage but his consultancy is what he'll be doing at the end of this season right when he moves into the director's room upstairs and has a little word in whoever comes in as manager in their ear say you know what maybe strengthen in this area. I think John McGinn could work there, not as a as a focal point, obviously, and, and perhaps not what I would suggest because central midfield is the need. But I'll tell you what, what I like about John McGinn when you watch Aston Villa is he does seem kind of fit for uh, that sort of support all action role. He pops up like three times a game and three times a game you say to yourself, oh yeah, John McGinn's on Villa. Like it's these are these three moments where he, he cuts in, he makes a late run into the box to get a good chance, or he takes an audacious shot, or he makes a, a massive tackle, uh, times those out well. So I really do like him as a player. For me, though, it's about, look, if Paul Pog was going to leave, and it seems like that is more likely than not, um, how do you fit the bill there? Because you have Bruno Fernandez who can do a lot of what Paul Pogba does uh, in the final third. You will, in theory, have a defensive midfielder who could take care of that. And Scott McTominay, to me, is interesting as we as we evaluate what is going to be the future of that midfield. I think you could see um, a situation where it's completely reorganized. They need their Wilfred and Didi. Um, everybody needs a Conte, so I'm taking a step slightly down. Sorry, Leicester fans, but they need their Wilfred and Didi. Um, and I know Fred tries to fill that role and Fred is probably better than most people think because he's become a little bit of a, a little ostracized there but find me that guy and then fullbacks as well is interesting to me I don't know that they necessarily need one um, but as Rangnick evaluates them we've seen him often go to Delo. Um, he likes Alex Tellez Juan Bissaka is still there Shaw is still there what is the future there because I think all four of those guys can play it's just a matter of who's the right fit for what United wants to do 
Exactly. And I think in this 4 2 2 2 system under Rangnick, they need to get some balance. Is that the way they're going to go forward? What kind of midfield do they need? There's a lot of big questions there because defensively, some decent defensive midfielders, but all very similar, I, I feel. And they do need to freshen up there with Matic, Fred, and McTominay. And they need, if Pogba is going to leave like we all think he is, they need that number eight, that bit more dynamic central midfielder who can burst from midfield and, and really link midfield and attack. It sounds easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. And very few players do it well consistently, game in, game out. And that's what United, for me, are really missing, especially in recent weeks. We've seen their forward line just almost stood 30 yards up the pitch from the rest of the team. And not a lot is happening in between that. Andy, Tottenham Hotspur, I feel like they need that kind of midfielder as well. A number number eight, all action. We've spoken about that. Maybe a centre-back as well. That's their biggest transfer need to focus on for Antonio Conte over the next couple of transfer windows. Yeah, it should be really easy, and I can be short with this one. I think Spurs' defence is actually quite good under Conte. He has been defending well, and, and, and having the extra body back there uh, has been really advantageous for them. I think the attack, the players, the trio that they've got up top with Kane and Son and, and Lucas Mora, I think that's also really good, and they have history working together. It's the thing right in the middle that connects those two that is, one, holding back each one of those things, but I think also making life harder on the other. They're unable to progress the ball after they win it and get it to that forward line, which then puts you know, pressure and, and, and counterattacking chances on the defense. And then the defense is under a little bit of pressure and then they're not able to feed the forward line. So it's just a repetitive cycle. It was supposed to be in Dombele. It was supposed to be La Celso. It's neither of those guys. They can both move on either in January or in the summer, get in whoever's going to be the right player for Conte. And I think he needs to have significant say on who it's going to be. And I think he will. And then finally, maybe finally, uh, everybody at Spurs can start pulling in the same direction. Weston McKenney has been linked time and time again with Tottenham. I mean, that would be a really good fit um, for the U.S. men's national team, for him and for Tottenham, I think, for what they're looking for. Flexible, all-action uh, midfielder. Let's see if that happens. Uh, but it, it's been really fun to do this and have the transfer needs post up on Pro Soccer Talk and EmbassySports.com. You can go and check that out for all 20 teams, what they need in January. I'll be updating it throughout the month. And it is fun to see because a lot of teams need very similar players. And uh, there's only so many quality players that uh, are around to take them to the next level and take them to where they want to go to. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.